evening. My name is Reverend Campbell, and this is Reading Aloud Live. We're going to be reading the fifth part of the Might is Right book. <laughs> saying this really strangely, I don't know why. This is the 1896 version of the book, initial release. And uh, so it's uh, got a little bit of age to the copy that I'm reading. But it's copyright free, so can't really argue with that, right? Uh, Vasiri, good to see you, man. I dig it. Zachary, how are you? Good to see you. Hopefully we get into some uh, wild and crazy stuff here. Uh, and, and let's be honest, what we're reading is a racist, bigoted, elitist volume. One out of three ain't bad. I'll let you choose the one. Uh, how you doing, Valeria? Good to see you. Um, so we've already read four parts of this, and I'm breaking it down into two-hour reading sections. And so clearly, we've been doing this for a while. This is a much longer volume than I actually anticipated it being. We're not, I don't think, going to be able to finish it tonight. But I think the next time we do it, I will be able to. Um, Billy, thanks for joining, man. All right. Like I said, we're starting with seven. It's incredibly hot here. And so I'm wearing shorts along with this getup. And I started thinking, I'm... A man in shorts reading Midas Right, which is this manifesto about power. You can't be powerful wearing shorts. No man in history has ever looked powerful wearing shorts. A kilt, yeah. Shorts? No. Never. So I don't know. <laughs> I'm kind of feeling um, like I should put pants on. But then I'd be sweating through them. I don't want to do that. It's too much. Only 55 pages? If that's all that's left, then we can definitely do it. But it depends on how much I talk. Because I got the gift of gab. You know what I mean? Maybe I should just shut up and read. Uh, but that being said, thanks for joining us, Behemoth. Good to see you, man. All right. Well, if you have any questions or comments throughout the course of the readings, I'm going to stop just for a breather between each section. Put them in the chat. Let's have a conversation while we're doing this. It's going to be good. It's going to be fun. So let's do it. Seven. Better far for a free animal to be killed outright than to be mastered, subordinated, and enchained. Mentally, morally, physically, a full-grown man should swear allegiance to no extraneous moralism, custom, or arbitrary rule of conduct. He ought to take a special pride in developing his own individuality, independent of all other men whatsoever. In the maxim, union and strength, there lies an abiding fallacy. Very often in practical affairs, he is greatest who stands most apart. Every man for himself is the law of life. Every man for an institution, a god or a dogma is the law of death. Mind your own business is a line of thought very much neglected in this infirm age, when every sodden degenerate fancies that it is his business to be every other degenerate's keeper, guardian, and nurse. Cain's wrathful retort, am I my brother's keeper, contains a far-reaching practical philosophy that is deserving of calm consideration in the light of contemporary socialistic maladjustments and biologic evolutionism. Only the terrorized repent but non-moralists found families, build cities, rule the earth, and laugh at the gods. Each individual should think as he pleases, as the spirit moves him, without the least respect for what others think or do. The only limit to his actions being, of course, the materialized opposition he actually meets with, for the strong are the natural limit of the strong. No one is bound to obey another or a majority except the other can coerce obedience. And to do that at all times, under all circumstances, would be terribly troublesome, expensive, and dangerous. When actualized antagonism is met with, it is every dauntless man's business to surmount it if he can. Should he find that beyond his strength or the massed power of his friends and supporters, then death or submission are the only reasonable alternatives, if he has not the nerve to fall as the much maligned Catiline fell in Pistoria, then he and his posterity to the third and fourth generation must sink to subjectivity. 
If he is coerced by superior strength or strategy into temporary retreat, he then owes no allegiance whatever to his triumphant adversaries, and he should be ever ready, when time and tide seem pro um, propitiatory, to overwhelm and destroy their dictation. Get there, I say, get there. Get there at any cost. Be you a true knight. Save thyself by thy own high deeds. If a man wound you on one cheek, lay him low. Smite him hip and thigh. Self-preservation is the first law of thy being. Hate for hate and ruth for ruth. Scorn for scorn and tooth for tooth. Get there, I say, get there. Get there at any cost. Let him no longer boast of his bravery who merely weeps with his dear ones when his dear ones weep for bread. The gallant and the brave have not yet been known to want for anything. Women shed tears, men shed them not. Cowards serve masters, bold men make themselves masters. When passing through the valley of humiliation, slaves and dastards exposing their sores sob aloud for consolation and sympathy. Brave men stand apart and ponder vengeance or conquest. Man is man and the master of his fate. The fear of death is the beginning of slavery. Majority box despotism can only be maintained by making a sudden and violent death its final sanction. Civilized men are terrorized at the idea of death, and as long as that is so, those who wield sudden death in the hollow of their hand are masters of the world. Hence, a small body of disciplined fighters, if protected by the death penalty, are capable of dominating a nation of 10,000 times their number. Hence also, in accordance with the fight fire with fire principle, all secret associations aiming at the destruction of established tyrannies in church or state have ever been organized from the most ancient times upon a death penalty basis. When successful, these societies become government in their turn, merely reforming as defense forces instead of aggressive forces. On this account, the inner workings of government are unknown to the outer world. Every ministerial cabinet is oath-bound, and all the higher officials are pledged and obligated under a death penalty to the most strict secrecy. Indeed, under the cover of popular government, the financial empire of the world is an established fact. No man has or ever had any inherent right to the use of the earth, nor to personal independence, nor to property, nor to wives, nor to liberty of speech, nor to freedom of thought, nor to anything, except he can by himself or in conjunction with his allies assert his rights by power. What are, in popular parlance, called rights are really spoil. The prerogatives of formally exerted might, but a right lapses immediately when those who are enjoying it becomes incapable of further maintaining it. Consequently, all rights are as transient as morning rainbows international treaties, or clauses in a temporary armistice. They may be abrogated at any moment by any one of the contracting parties holding the necessary power. Broadly speaking, therefore, might is incarnated right, and rights are metamorphosed mights. Power and justice are synonyms for might is mighty and does prevail. Those who possess the undisputable might, be they one, ten or ten million, may and do proclaim the right. Government is founded on property, property is founded on conquest, and conquest is founded on power, and power is founded on brain and brawn, on organic animality. Just as parents dictate rights to their children, so masterful animals dictate rights to millions and millions of sodden, li livered, baby-minded men. Monarchic rulers are the gaudy jumping jacks and representative institutions, the tax-gathering mechanism of the mighty ones. Banks and safe deposits are their treasure stores, and armies and navies, their sentinels, executioners, watchmen. There's much to be said for the opinion, writes Professor Huxley, that force effectually and thoroughly used, so as to render further opposition useless, establishes an ownership that should be recognized as soon as possible. 
Professor Jevons expresses a parallel thought. The first step must be to rid our minds of the idea that there is such things as abstract rights. Spiritual right and moral right cannot possibly be explained because they are merely verbalisms without solid substance. They are not even shadows, for a shadow implies a materialized actuality. It is somewhat difficult to define what is non-existent. That task may be left to the university professors and Sunday school divines. They are adepts at clothing their mental nudity in clouds of wondrous verbosity. Right, in its broadest and deepest sense, can be logically defined, however, as the manifestations of solar energy, materialized through human thought and through upon battlefields, that is to say, in nature's supreme court. Might is victory, and victory establishes rightness. Might is cosmic power and chemic operation, and man, in his own sphere, is heliocentric force on two legs. Might is mighty and must prevail. It does prevail, for verily it is as the law of gravitation. Nay, it is the law of gravitation. It is the law. All right. <laughs> nice. All right, so um, that was fun. I love, I love just the ranting nature of it. You don't really know where he's going to go. It seems like he's going left, and then he veers right, and then he goes back a left a little bit, and then he veers right again. It's a lot all over the place. But it is fun, and I love it when every once in a while you spot a line or even part of a sentence that the doctor took and sort of reworked. I love finding those. It's like um, little nuggets of gold in the sieve, you know? Kind of cool. Let's continue. Eight. All arbitrary rules of right and wrong are insolent invasions of personal liberty. He who would maintain his manhood must ignore them and abandon them wherever and whenever possible, except he has investigated them, paralleled them with nature, and without coercion, agrees to abide thereby as a modus vendi. If he accepts them on other occasions as his lifelong load, that is, his funeral. If he is eager to handicap himself or commit suicide, why shouldn't he? That's his own business. A sensible man should never conform to any rule or custom simply because it has been highly recommended or highly commended by others, alive or dead. If they are alive, he should suspect their motives. If dead, they're out of court. He should be a law unto himself in all things. Otherwise, he permits himself to be demonetized to the level of a domesticated animal. The real man must depend upon himself absolutely, determine his own ends, decide his own plan of campaign, and savagely represent any authoritarian interference, especially if it takes the form of socialistic officialism. He must be resolutely on his defense against all those meddlesome dogs who dare to impose their squalid ideals upon his private or public life. It would be well for him also to be a thorough-going and dangerous adversary, as well as an unswerving friend. To his foemen, he should be as pitiless as the gods. To his friends, in all days of difficulty and danger, he should be as an army with banners. Therefore, I say, be manly! Be both manly and wise. Be fearless, tenacious, resolute, and bold. For as von Clausewitz sagely insists, boldness directed by an overruling intelligence is the brand of a hero. A man's first duty to this world is to himself, and the word himself includes those near and dear ones who have twined their tendrils around his heart. A man's kindred are part of himself, he should not forget that when fighting for his own hand, he is fighting for them. His strength is their rampart. Their strength is his glory. The family and the individual are a unit. Henry Watterson, an insolent editor of the New Dispensation in a studied oration before the Wall Street Board of Trade, thus brazenly revoices the divine right of communalism over the fates of men. We are to teach the lessons that the citizen exists for the government, not the government for the citizen. 
Ignatius, Loyos, Calvins, Dukes of Alva, Torquematas, and Piuses by the score have been equally eloquent in expounding parallel diabolical sophisms. For ages, these destroyers of liberty proclaimed that the individual existed for the Holy Church, not the Holy Church for the individual. However, the despotism of socialistic sacred dolatism has been thoroughly tamed, blown to fragments, as it were, and the rights of private judgment fully maintained. It's cunning recrudescence under the guise of state infallibility by the Jesuit of journalistic dial diablo diablery must be met as resolutely and smashed as savagely relentlessly as its infernal theocratic prototype. The majesty of the individual first, foremost, and above all things, hell's blazes, and realized among us when the individual withers and the state grows more and more. Should the Watersonian ideal triumph, every man who then dares open his mouth except to extol authority will run the risk of having streams of lead pumped into it as a gentle hint to be constitutional. He who acts upon self-denial principles in his dealings with rival carnivores casts himself down that they may climb over his prostrate personality to their success. He abdicates his inherent royalty who bends before any human being or any human dogma but his own. Humbleness is a crime in a man, though it may be a virtue in a menial. The modest man permits his rivals to occupy all the high places and make him their footstool, nay, their very doormat. Of course, there are certain imprescriptible higher laws which no one can even try to rebel against without being quietly executed. The transgressor of a natural ordinance may think he has escaped, even while the noose knot is under his chin and the bolt about to be sprung. Nature is a very long arm and a vengeful one. Many a city of the plain has been incinerated besides Sodom and Gomorrah. Individual transgressors of nature are always driven mad, and nations that organize defiance to the nature of their being become regimented hordes of incoherent manlings suddenly perspiring downward into their heaven, prancing the dance of death, shrieking the songs of progress. Observe, for example, the working classes of civilization and the utter lunacy of their doings. Undoubtedly, their god has struck them blind, or mayhap they are possessed of a devil. Certainly they are not sane. The day is near at hand when they shall cry out with shame, Oh, would that we were dead! As rapidly as machinery can be perfected, the perform the work now being done by these animals. They are being dispensed with, turned adrift in hordes to find fodder and shelter as best they can. Hired men are rapidly becoming cheaper than horses and dogs, but as yet somewhat dearer than electric motors and steam engines. The average workman, therefore, feels instinctively that his virtues may not, after all, preserve his throat from the knife, that is to say, from the logical consequences of his own, or his forefather's defeat in the struggle. His virtues, as he calls them, poor devil, are extreme laboriousness, extreme docility, extreme political and religious credulity, together with extreme pusillanimity pusillanimity in his own defense. As long as power requires these hordes of slave hirelings, they will be provided with enough necessaries to keep themselves in proper trim. But when their labor force is no longer a profitable investment, they will assuredly be eliminated. Why should prisoners of war be kept alive anyhow at vast expense, when it becomes cheaper and more convenient to turn them adrift, to perish as valueless stock, perish on ranges in wintertime. Already, many of these free-born citizens are cutting their throats daily in despair at being unable to find a master. Millions are also slowly drugging themselves with succulent poisons in the shape of alcoholic and other stimulants. Scientific sterilization is an established custom. Infanticide, a regular trade, and celibacy increasing by leaps and bounds. The fact is that the industrial world is run on business principles, and business principles are a synonym for woe to the vanquished. Hell, take the hindmost. The survival of the fittest, and might is right. Right.
like water, finds its own level. Man's consent is not necessary to the operations of natural forces. It is not required. It is not even asked. He is like unto a patient, strapping firmly upon a dissecting table. He may feel the surgeon's lance sinking through his quivering flesh. He may shiver in terror and break out in a cold sweat. He may groan in convulsive agony and pray to his idol. But he cannot escape. Knowing all this, why not let nature alone to work out her own silent ends? Why should communities of creeping things try to safeguard their incapables? Why obstruct the drastic and significant removal of corrupted organisms? The Jesus type of men were clearly made to be crucified and flogged. The Buddha type were, evidently, born to die of pestilence and famine. Poor, weak, cowardly swarms of rotting vermin that they are. Behold them in the distance there, with their ribs sticking through their hides, accepting with doleful thankfulness the alms of their conquerors. Brahma! Buddha! Confucius! Juggernaut! Christ! Behold! Behold! Your glorious handiwork! Let the cowardly and the vile die off! Let them annihilate themselves! That is the logic of the spheres. The atmosphere of this terrestrial ball will be purer when these heavy-laden souls are gone, and there will be elbow room upon its surface for the regeneration of purity and cleanliness of mind and body. At the banquet of life, let no seat be reserved for those who cannot win it, who cannot break into the enchanted circle by force of character and the force of deeds. See page 13. The impotent and the brainless who call themselves the righteous are better dead anyhow, better for themselves and better for their successors. Is it not the height of madness for communities to deliberately nourish and foster the bacteria of hereditary degeneration? Degeneration? Superiority can only be decided by battle. Conflict is an infallible method of selection and rejection. Evolution has no end. That is undoubtedly the logical deduction of Darwin's famous pronouncement. If he, man, is to advance still higher, it is to be feared that he must remain subject to a severe struggle. Otherwise, he would sink into indolence, and the more gifted men would not be more successful than the less gifted. It is only incoherence of subjective willpower or of servile extraction bottle-fed beings, as it were, that even dream of an ordered state of society, wherein right and wrong, or personal merit, can be decisively decided upon other than biological principles. Hebrew decadence harpen unto this fool thought of universal peace, equality, justice, and fair play for ages, but have they not been a pestilent tribe of unwarlike slaves from their leprous beginning? The greatest poem of their repulsive literature inculcates the virtue of patience and submission under intolerable injustice. All their gyrating prophets scream and sob and yell over the wholesale failure of epileptoid ethical standards and insanely proclaim a good time coming when every Israelite shall recline under his own vine and fig tree with no one to make him afraid. How delightful! Moses, Jesus, Isaiah, Peter, Mark, Matthew, Luke, and John were all squalid Jews and rhapsodical communards. Those Hebrew breeders of desolation, LaSalle, Dr. Adler, Jacobi, Karl Marx, are modernized transplanted essences, Ebionites. All moral injunctions, all millennialisms, are arbitrary infernalisms. The result of crafty hypnotic suggestion. Their secret object is the overthrow of human reason and individual independence in order to establish a vast bedlamite penitentiary to be called God's kingdom on earth, alias pandemonium in full blast. The fact is, humanity is going to start staring mad in consequence of having eaten the fruit that grows on that devilish tree, the tree of knowledge of good and evil, luscious it is to look upon, pleasant it is to the palate, but a deadly atrophine, a cunning poison, lurks in its core. Cursed are they that eat thereof. 
Aye, thrice cursed are the believers in right and wrong, for they are the erring ones. Oh, mama. Ooh. All right, what you got, Sam? I can't even read the damn comments. It's so small. <laughs> I think uh, Ragnar actually thought of, Ra of um, Valhalla as a metaphor in the same way we Satanists think of Satan. Um, I, I, I actually don't think he believes in any type of afterlife, at least based on what I'm reading anyway. I, there's a lot of this until he gets into the um, anti-Semite bullshit that when he's talking about um, the individual over the state that I do really kind of agree with. And it's, it's really weird because at the same time that I'm reading this, I'm reading um, the Federalist Papers, which are arguing for the Constitution of the United States uh, and, and specifically over maintaining the union of the 13 colonies rather than splitting them up into various states or confederacies. And to compare and contrast that argument with this of the individual over all else, I find it rather interesting. And I do like the idea of um, that, that he espouses in this last section where you carry those you love with you um, when you go into battle for, for property or, or money or, or whatever, victory as it were. Um, because ultimately I, I completely agree with that concept. You know, you, you choose those you care about and they're the ones you are fighting for in addition to yourself. What I don't necessarily agree to is his um, seeming lack of willingness to work the system, as it were, right? So if you live in a society, it's really about being practical, right? So Satanists in general, uh, whatever society they live in, are going to fake being a part of that society for self-preservation. Maybe they won't even come out as Satanists at all. Maybe not even admit it to themselves, because if they did, it might get out and they might end up being murdered for it in certain regions of this world. Um, and, and so the idea of working within the existing system in order to earn your own ends, to validate your own might, to see your will be done, as it were, I think is a more practical way of doing things than shitting on the society you live in and then wondering why you're not getting anywhere. Uh, Zachary, I think you're right. He would wish us all dead, but he wouldn't do anything about it. He would just complain. <laughs> and that's the total irony of all of this. He didn't do anything. He just wrote a manifesto about violence and might and then never exerted any of either, <laughs> which is really funny. This guy. Yeah, he'd, he'd totally write an entire tome about it. All right. <clears throat> Let's get into this. Hey, love him or hate him, there's some solid principles in this. <laughs> Not all of them, but there are some. And that makes it, it, it all the more interesting. Nine. Attraction and gravitation holds the stars in their courses, and upon exactly the same general operative method, all human swarms and animal herds are integrated and disintegrated by effective manifestations of derivative solar heat and power. Strong men are magnetized incarnations of primordial energy, dynamos of concentrated electricity. There is a mysterious, almost magical charm about the personality of true greatness. Lesser men are attracted to the natural chiefs as steel shavings are drawn to the lodestone. This peculiar attractive force is hardly ever seen except spasmodically in physical weaklings. It seems to develop only in animals of unusual vitality, men with plenty of devil in them. Physical power is the basis of mental power. The nutriment... The nutriment of the brain cells is derived from the blood corpuscles perpetually being pumped into it by the heart's action. If the pump valves are weak or out of gear, if the food stream is impure, if the stomach is disordered, if the liver is congested or the lungs decaying and corrupt, then the brain is starved, drugged, poisoned, 
while all our thoughts that germinate therein are feeble, unnatural, impure. Hence the rolling stream of literary filth that the Zolas and the Bible boomers and poetlings and the imminent savants keep pouring out upon generations of men soaked for ages in similar intellectual sewage. Hence also the remarkable fact that neither great men nor great heroisms are ever town-bred. Cities are impure in thought, word, and deed, and nothing that is noble can ever evolve therein. They are the refuse heaps, the jokin motings of the world. They are matrixes of all that is shameful and base in religion, politics, sociology, and law. Lupinars of organized abomination are they, where the infamous prostitute and the still more infamous editor poison the air, side and side, spreading abroad the leprous contagion with every wind that blows, with that I were a Nero and could play the fiddle. But after all, perhaps, it would be a waste of matches and good catgut. Great men can only evolve from out an environment of comparative personal independence. They come from the mountains and forest clearings. They grow to maturity with the storm beating upon them and the rains dripping down on them. First warring against the rivalry of the elements, they develop the tremendous motor power necessary in afterlife for the mastership of manhoods. Entering into the centers of semi-moribund moribund civilizations, they straightway take the lead as a matter of natural right. They become rulers, chancellors, kings, conquerors, electric batteries, dynamos. Slave-bred swarms toil at their bidding with zealous contentment, and rivals are casting down, as it were, by a turn of the wrist. Their smile is wealth and honor to lesser men. Their frown is poverty, outlawry, or the bowstring. Second-class animals gather around them and are used up as satraps, governors, lieutenants. If a nation, under process of exploitation, revolts, the revolt is suppressed by force. If established rulers are incapable of that task, and they are overthrown, and leaders of a revolt rule in their stead as a matter of course. Rulers' control depends absolutely upon their might. When unable any longer to wield the death penalty, their powers departed. The French aristocracy originated in the savage deeds of fierce, long-haired, battered Franks, and their effeminate descendants were overwhelmed and guillotined by grim provincials who came to Paris hungry for money, power, and renown. In the regions of stellar space, similar phenomena may be noted. That sun star with the strongest attractive power whirls other and lesser stars around it until it comes in contact with a rival rolling mass of greater magnitude and attractiveness, whereupon it is absorbed and loses its individuality. What the law of gravitation is to matter and motion, the law of might is in the province of sociology. In this analogy, there is illimitable significance embedded. Star life is known to be an immense emanation of primeval plutonic energy. Our planetary system is like unto one whirling note among countless myriads in a vitalized sunbeam. Our Earth is a byproduct of secondary cyclonic rage. The sun itself, the powerhouse of our world, is materialized heat force in active operation, manifesting itself as warmth, light, motion, electricity, and animal life. Man's body and sustenance is derived directly or indirectly from the sun, but it he but it he lives, dies, and has his being. Let heliocentric force be withdrawn for an instant, and all life straightway disappears. Thus, everywhere throughout eternity, under all circumstances and at all times, this world, all worlds, and all that creeps thereon, are driven, inspired, vitalized, and guided by active operating force. Everywhere is might that governs, feebleness that is governed, attracted, repelled, controlled. Force propels iron-ribbed reindeers of the sea and hurls them plunging through the gray-green surges. Force whirls the loaded freight cars over prairie, range, and river. 
workforce hauls up from the deep sunk mines vast treasures of gold, iron, silver, and coal. Force rolls the red glowing metal ingots into titanic shapes. Force sows the seed, plows the field, reaps the grain, threshes the corn, hews the stone, shapes the grinders, bridges rivers, mows down forests, builds cities, writes the book, inspires it, prints it, defends it. Even the music of the spheres is the vibrant roar of warring elementals chanting the glory of power. It forces the all-in-all -all of the planetary systems and of the animal world. May it not also be the open sesame of sociology, the primeval principle that governs and must continue to govern the relations of tribe to tribe and man to man. Is it not the gospel of antiquity as well as the logical reducto of today? Whether in mortgaged republics, pawned monarchies, or hypothecated despotisms, the sword power, that is to say the military power, the clubbing power, is the ultimate ipsa dixit in the measuring out of right and wrong. And it was in the days of the forces Sesostris, the devastating Genghis, the venturesome Charlemagne, so it is even now. In all industrial relations, might is monarch of all its surveys. Authority is authority, though it may take on thousand diverse forms. What is the elemental difference between a Roman mandamus, a Turkish firman, a Russian ukase, a Supreme Court injunction, or an order in chancery? They are exact synonyms. Whatever their salient phraseology may be in operation, they are visible manifestations of imperial power, of sceptered majesty. No sacerdotal sophistry can permanently disguise this fact, and what is more important, no emotional demagoguery can remove it. Authority is not an evil in itself. It is as natural for men of power to rule feeble multitudes as it is for the lion to eat the lamb. When any nation or class of men possess no real might, it is just and proper that they should be subordinated. And again, if they develop the requisite strength, it is equally justifiable for them to conquer their former position and subordinate their subordinators. Evolution works through authority, but there is to it no limitation. The penalty of defeat is tremendous. Wage earning is, in modern times, the main clause in the treaty under which the defeated are permitted to exist. Even-handed justice has never existed in the animate creation and never can. The very idea of it is an absurdity. Evolution knows it not. Between beasts of burden and beasts of prey, also between capital and labor, there is an eternal combat. Natural enemies, as they of each other, and whichever proves the stronger must rule for the time being, or rather, until the next test. The law of battle is unlimited. It does not end today or tomorrow. It persists for all time. Between the optimates and the populaires of Rome, the Aristos and Helots of Greece, the merchant kings and Nubian serfs of Carthage, the military caste and the slaves of Karnak and Memphis, the same irrepressible conflict raged for long centuries that is now being waged everywhere between the haves and the have-nots. Indeed, the agrarian agitation and the tumultuous strife between the debtor and the creditor classes in modern America is an exact duplicate of what happened in the Greco-Roman world. Modern leaders, however, on both sides are poor, miserable weaklings compared with the chiefs of antiquity. Mere infants as they are, delighting in toys and lullabies, seeing they see not, hearing they hear not, minds they have, but they know not, laughing and prattling they say not most eloquently. To them their petty provincial cradle is the universe and their lives and aimless wanderings in the land of dreams. The men who talk of permanently reconciling conflicting worldwide energies are wasting their breath for naught, Comprises out of the compromises out of the question now as of old, except as a temporary expedient. 
The rich and the poor are both inevitable natural products and complements of each other, like the opposing currents in an electric battery. It is the business of the rich to exploit the poor, and it is equally the business of the poor to defeat and exploit in their turn. The oppression of one class by another is always induced by the physical cowardice of the victimized, and nature has no law love for dastards, whether rich or poor. Oppression is one of the necessary phases of evolution. In order, therefore, to ensure the subordination and ultimate annihilation of lower types, the struggle for survival is imposed upon humans as upon all other animals, even when our eminent wiselings are predicting eras of universal peace and contentment, the contending cohorts are preparing to jump at each other's throats as of yore. Might must decide all things in the future, as it has decided all things in the past. And they who teach otherwise are either dishonest or have no real conception of the magnitude and consequence of biological determinants. All the world is now in debt, and no human effort can ever suffice to repay the interest, let alone the principal in cash. Business lives under a cloud of mortgage indebtedness that must someday be liquidated with shot and shell for bonds and fur bondage. All realized wealth is transfigured force, and want of it a sure sign of sterility and degeneracy. Industrialism is the manipulation of force by force. Brains and muscles are part of the mechanism of gravitation. Descendants of prisoners of war have been trained for ages in servitude, and they make most intelligent mechanics, specialists, and serving men. Capital is concentrated force applied to the extraction and storage of additional force. It may be operated by its proprietor in any way that he pleases. He is under no obligation to other as to its application or proprietorship. He can do as he likes with his own, as long as he has the power. He may own the earth by its agency if he wants to, and he may buy or sell men and nations if he feels so inclined or thinks it's prof profitable. There is in nature no limit to his energies or ambitions. All that is needed is power equal to the design. But the same principles may be acted upon by any other man or association of men, and in the conflict that ensues, fitness is proved, absolutely and without doubt. The rights of the rich and what they can maintain, and the rights of the poor, are no less. No bounds are set to the accumulation of property, and none whatever to its redistribution. Fair play is not even an essential or a requisite. It may be established if mutually desired by both combatants, but it may also be wholly dispensed with. In real life, it is always dispensed with by those who possess a preponderance of material might. Equality can only exist among equals. Civilization implies division of labor, and division of labor implies subordination, and subordination implies injustice and inequality. Woe to me if I speak not truth! At such words as these, pusillanimity blanches with timid gatherers in its idle halls, supplicating, Lord have mercy upon us! Christ have mercy upon us! Deliver us! from evil. In primitive communities, the philosophy of power is thoroughly understood and acted upon by all classes, even by the survey. The ideas of abstract justice, righteousness, non-resistance can find no lodgment in an uncorrupted brain. Life is too grim in a camp of hunters and of warriors for artificialism to meet with anything more appreciative than a good-natured sarcasm. He who has to hunt for his family dinner every forenoon and see land, sees land on which to build his shelter is not overlikely to enthusiastically swallow the depraved theora of self-renunciation or pledge unbounded allegiance to the self-appointed ring of tax gatherers masquerading as political philanthropists. He maintains his own inherent independent royalty as long as he can and never surrenders except before absolute superior force. Even then, he vows limitless vengeance and obligates his sons and his sons' sons to undying hatred against the domination and spoliation of his conquerors. Sorry, guys, I'm stumbling. 
The power of wealth compels you. That's right. That's funny. Uh, <laughs> thanks, Vic. <laughs> Sorry, just looking at this. You know what I, I think is, is kind of interesting um, when you look at what we would consider the mightiest of people, right? So, so um, athletes of the highest level who compete in combat sports, for example, they train for their fight, then they fight, and then they are broken, even if they win, and they have to take months to recuperate. It's, it's sort of like that idea of the tortoise and the hare, right? So the hare is going as fast as he possibly can and then hits a brick wall and can't go anymore, whereas the tortoise is just kind of moving along at his own pace, passes the hare and passes the finish line, winning it. So when we think of our most powerful, most mighty members of our species, they're only mighty in tiny increments of time. After years and months or months of year in years of work to get to that tiny moment. And then they are again, disintegrated. The, the most beautiful and, and bold looking bodies in film, they work up to that, dehydrating themselves, wearing out their bodies so that they can look the way they look. And then they completely stop so that they can recuperate and they go back to their regular lives. So this idea of mighty at all times being mighty is a fucking lie. It's not true. And would it not be a more rational way of living to have regular exercise and contest, but not to the point of deterioration and months of inaction? And to speak in the context of might is right, if you just have a, a moderate uh, exercise regimen, you will forever be ready for battle. And when those mighty have their broken moments, you come in and crush them. <laughs> I don't know. It, it really feels like um, these ideas of supermen, as it were, are inherently flawed. <laughs> but whatever. The mightiest are winners who are perceived as the weak. Interesting. The mightiest individuals in our society today are the wealthy. Whomever owns the most debt now owns the world. It is really weird, right? <clears throat> I'm going to get back to this in just one second. It is really weird that we, we, we base value on individuals and groups on the amount of debt that they have and the rate at which they repay that debt. Not in how much debt they don't have or have never had. Try getting a car if you've never incurred debt and paid it back. You won't have a credit score. So no one will loan you money. Your value as an individual is based on your the amount of debt that you have one, at one time and the regular interval of repaying that debt still maintaining that debt. How messed up is that? It should be the other way around. <laughs> the value of the individual is never having been in debt. That should be the greatest, but no, that's not how we work. Um, Zachary, no, you're right until your general murders you. <laughs> I mean, we've, we've had examples throughout all of history. It's the warrior, Roman life, all historical life. It's not the wealthy that rule, it's the mightiest. It's only recent, if we're going off wealth, that they are the ones in control. Yeah, you value as, your value as a slave to the system of the capital. It's depressing. All right, I'll continue. It's getting hot. <clears throat> 10. In evolution, there is no finality. It is operating always in some form, endeavoring to blot out inferior organisms and perpetuate more perfect types. Like the gods of antiquity, it is both a destructive and a creative. The powerful of the past were overthrown by the more powerful of the present, and in strict sequence, the powerful of today may be, must be, overthrown by the more powerful of tomorrow. 
All moral dogmatisms and religiosities are positive hindrances to the evolution of the higher manhood, inasmuch as men who honestly grasp at morals do not as energetically grasp at power, power being essentially non-moral. Consequently, the struggles between the propertied and the property-less classes is not as keen as nature evidently intends it to be. The moral man is a feeble antagonist to non-moral generalship. His, he foolishly permits talkative personalities with sharper perceptive qualities to wield unlimited authority over him under numerous plausible pretexts and deliberately plunder him for his property. There is far and away too much weepful mea culpa about the average mannequin. Hence the woes of the world. Hence the origin of the morbid craving by dwindlings for what they call a peaceful solution of the social problem. Weak natures are terrorized at the idea of what might happen in a death grapple with entrenched adversaries equally as strong, if not stronger, than themselves. That is the true reason why rich men are so anxious at all times to avoid discussion and maintain the peace, and why poor men hunger with fatness about around them and thirst while the waters flow near, for the law and the gospel hath damned them and dulled all their senses with fear. The fact is that both sides are afraid of each other, afraid of the only rational solution. My curse be upon the white-livered and the meek, the shameful dwindlings who call themselves the virtuous, the law-abiding, the righteous, the godly, the obedient ones. May civilization pump its vile narcotism throughout the flaccid ventricles of their pigeon hearts. May they inhale brain leprosy through the open windows of their temples of soot, and may their noisome swineries and splendid ergastuli be unto them living tombs. May they earn their bread, also that of their conquerors, by the slimy sweat of dishonored brows. And may they perish at the last like abandoned curs. May they vegetate in poverty and die in contempt. May the evil works of their genius be plowed under with Babylon and Nineveh. And now you act in Rome. May the annals of their dismal domination become as the folk tale of a fearsome nightmare that once rolled over the brain of mankind. Finally dissipating itself, mist thunders and lightnings and the breaking up of the great deep. Verily, verily, let them have their reward they richly deserve. It is customary for atrophied minds like Blanchelli to urge that the promulgation of such grim thoughts endanger the foundations of society. Even supposing that to be so, what is society anyhow that its foundations should not be threatened? Is society something immaculate, something divine, something anointedly un -ultra human, something that must be safeguarded, right or wrong? Is it another sacred Mount Moriah temple and Urim and Thummim an Ark of the Covenant, a Sanctum Sanctorum, or merely an ass's head hidden behind a veil? Why should the phrase society in danger be equivalent to the proclamation of a rigid taboo or a fanatical crusade? Why? Man is the measurer! Society is altogether a matter of convenience, an implement, an expediency. It is the creation of man, and what man manufactures, he may modify or destroy. Society may be defined as an agglomeration of carnivorous and herbivorous animals seeking their natural prey and browsing along on whatever nutriment they pick up. It is nothing more than a herd of two-legged cattle, and there's nothing supernaturally divine about a herd. Indeed, the word herd always suggests Gadara. Human swarms have been integrated and disintegrated 10,000 times 10,000 by the centrifugal and centripetal energies of individuals. Societies have risen and societies have fallen, but man, the unit, the germ plasm persists. With the rising of the sun and the fall of the tides, man is not only the clay, but also the potter the paramount determinant. His fate is in his own hands absolutely within the length of his tether. To the strong all laws, 
are cobwebs. So long. And when society becomes irksome to the strong, they may dissolve it. Nay, it is their positive duty to dissolve it. Otherwise, it becomes their master and, consequently, their enemy and oppressor. Society in danger, therefore, is merely the hysteria of the megalomaniac. Society in some shape must exist, as long as there are two human beings left alive, for companionship is as natural to the homo as swarming is to the bee. When, however, the word society develops into a synonym for socialistic restraint, then it becomes a menace to the evolution of the tribe and ought to be broken up accordingly, without overmuch ceremony. Friendship is necessary and ennobling, but impersonal despotism is destructive of all dignity and manly virtue. The real danger is that innocent and natural combinations for mutual pleasure, comradeship, profit, and defense may transform themselves gradually into organized majority box tyrannies, enslaving institutionalisms and the most dictatorial and obnoxious character. When society is thus transfigured into a vast blackmailing corporation, the lives and property of its component units are absolutely at its mercy, and it therefore ought to be disintegrated, consciously, deliberately, pitilessly, and at whatever cost. Freedom cannot be bought too dear, for life without liberty is pandemonium. Government and society are two distinct entities, and care must be taken not to confound them. Society is the growth of mutual tolerance, friendship, and obligation, but government arises from physical force supplied by the strong to control and exploitation of the vanquished foes. The sanction of government is the same that holds good throughout the whole zoological and heliocentric scale, the sanction of the material might. That sanction should always be under test, because the most abject weaklings may brandish a sword, but we do not know he is a weakling until an other sword in the grip of a man is pointed at his throat. Beowulf, a Saxon song master, apostrophizing the sword, voices this primeval organon as it was instinctively understood by our, our ancestors. The war thing, the comrade, father of honor and giver of kingship, the fame smith, the song master, clear singing, clear slicing, sweet spoken, soft finishing, making death beautiful, life but a coin to be staking in the pastime, whose playing is more than transfer of being, Ark and Ark, Chief Builder, Prince and Evangelist, I am the will of God, I am the sword. It is only in ages saturated in atmospheres of brain-wrecking artificialism and consumptive communities steeping to the very lips and elemental errors that senile, degrading, anthropomorphic myths and manias are substituted for hard, bitter, common sense. All great truths are hard and bitter, but lies, to the morbidly inclined, are sweeter than honey. One by one, we abandon realisms to follow Fata Morganas. We are mortgaging our destiny to the pawnbrokers of decadence. Behold, the ledger maimed of the Orient, Orient demonizes the manhood of the West. We fight like women and feel as much the thoughts of our heart we guard where scarcely the scorn of a god could touch, the sneer of a fool hits hard. The treacherous tongue and the cowardly pen, the weapons of curs decide. They faced each other and fought like men in the days when the world was wide. And yet the world is beautiful, and beautiful as a blushing maiden, dreaming of her first lover, fair, laughs the morn and soft the breezes blow and men only awaiting captaining to capture and to possess manhood is demonetized this little pamphlet has been issued not for private profit but to assist in uprooting the alien and the pernicious ideals that have been for long centuries corrupting the blood and corroding the brain of europe and america Conventional moral dogmas and political standards of value are, like wooden idols, the work of men's hands, 
They have no real basis in nature, nor have they any supernatural sanction. Every one of them has been carving out of a worm-eaten lie, a brazen assumption of a mad mouse dream. Their impositions most insolent. Why should we bow down even in formal adulation before imbecile and unnatural principles invented thousands of years ago for the enslavement of oriental decadence? Have we not given lip service long enough to false heroisms and fool evangels? Why, foreign the possession of slave virtues? Oh, why feign the possession of slave virtues? Why continue to glorify untruths that we know to be untruths? Why should men of sterling worth Obey any other man's thou shalt. Let us return to nature for our moral standards. Let us search our own hearts and brains for the true meanings of right and wrong. We are living and dying, mostly dying, in a poisonous environment of deep-seated moral dementia, social disease, and political illusions. The righteous and the just, hypocrites, deceivers, enemies of all that is noble, courageous, and manly, destroyers of self-assertiveness, annihilators of heroism, would that I had a legion of demons to wring thy neck. A crucified Jew slave terrorized under authority is set up as a god, as a standard of measurement for all mankind. That is why personal valor and nobility of thought are at such a tremendous discount. Christendom is in bondage. Manhood is demonetized. Our race is betrayed. Ragnar Redbeard. <laughs> Ragnar Redbeard. It's only an hour and I'm stumbling. My goodness. We're at chapter six. <clears throat> I'm trying to, like, every time I see, like, a, um, incorrectly spelled word or something, I, I try to work it out. Uh, it doesn't always work all the time, though. Why well, continue to glorify untruths that we know to be untruths? I love that. When, however, the word society develops into a synonym for socialistic restraint, then it becomes a menace for the evolution of the type and ought to be broken up accordingly. Yeah. There's some great... Uh, hey, Rod. There's some really great lines in this. Like, like genuinely good. The thing is, he wasn't an idiot. Like, you can't argue that. He had ideas that aren't common nowadays, but certainly some of his, a lot of his ideas are based on historical reference witnessing the world as it is and that is satanic i find that interesting all right every time i hear that two wrongs don't make a right i keep thinking but three do i don't know where i heard that but it's always in my head at all times <clears throat> tell you what's torture is my wife's making pizza and i can smell it and I know I have another hour <laughs> before I can have any. That is torture. But let's continue. <laughs> it's got to be weird watching me do this. It's weird for me doing it. Chapter 6. Love and Women and War. The best fighters are the best race producers. This is the verdict of biology and the instinctive belief of the whole feminine world in general. In the molding of organic nature into all its diverse forms, love and war, with their attendant penalties and correlated consequences, are the two most potent factors. Battle is the furnace alembic that has been consciously provided for chemically separating the animate refuse from the gold. Sexual desire is the amalgam that thereafter unites the gold particles, perpetuating for ages and ages the selected qualities of physical beauty, vigor, bravery, endurance, or vice versa. I am convinced, writes Darwin, that natural selection has been the main, but not the exclusive, means of modification. 
The same thought has been gemmed in a more sentimental but equally suggestive setting by Dryden. Happy, happy, happy pair! None but the brave, none but the brave, none but the brave deserve the fair. Heraclitus condensed it into the terser dictum, strife is the parent of things. Even Solomon, the hoary old kingling, chanted it in characteristic oriental strophes. Love is stronger than death, the coals thereof are coals of fire, which hath a most vehement flame. Many waters cannot quench love, neither can the flood drown it. Jealousy is as cruel as the grave. Fighting is the method whereby the most fitted to propagate conclusively prove that fact. Animals, plants, birds, reptiles, and fishes all exist in surroundings of unending sex rivalry and warfare. So do men. Organic life is one ceaseless round of love and war. Sexualism and slaughter go hand in hand. Bacteria butchers bacteria. Germ wars with germ. Shark eats the shark. Tigers struggle with tigers. The lion rends the lion. Eagle kills eagle. And man fights man for the favor of the female. Or the plunder of the vanquished. Peace on earth and mercy mild is mere lunacy babblement. Even sheep, the most Christly of animals, wage tremendous duels in due season. There is no other earthly passion so fiercely, savagely egotistic as sexual desire, and it's the physical basis of all human love, even the most ethereal and romantic. Everywhere, the season of love is the season of battle, and when the fires of sexualism burn low and nations are men, they are as unfit for freedom as they are unfit to reproduce their kind. Toppenard explains how sexualism operates among vertebrates of the deep. The male, Artocephaly, sea bear, arrives at the Falkland Islands in November and scatter out along the beach. In December, the females arrive, and immediately violent battles are being fought in all directions for their possession. Family life follows exactly as among humans. If the females behave badly, the male chastises them. They crouch at his feet, seem to beg his pardon, and shed copious tears. At times, the male and female weep together. Monist. A geographer and naturalist of world repute, A. R. Wallace, proclaims a series of similar facts, facts that are not new to observant minds. Among the higher animals, it is a very general fact that the males fight together for the possession of the females. This leads to the stronger or better armed males becoming the parents of the next generation, which inherits the peculiarities of the parents, and thus vigor and offensive weapons are continually increased in the males, resulting in the strength and horns of the bull, the tusks and shield of the boar, the antlers and fleetness of the stag, and the spurs and fighting instinct of the game cock. But almost all male animals fight together, though not specific, specially armed. Even hares, moles, squirrels, and beavers fight to the death. The same rule applies to all male birds. From this very general phenomenon, there necessarily results a form of natural selection, which increases the vigor and fighting power of the male animal, the weaker being either killed, wounded, or driven away, as among men. In his Descent of Man, page 564, Darwin makes a similar general statement. With social animals, the young males have to pass through many a contest before they win a female, and the older males have to retain their females by renewed battles. They have also, as in the case of mankind, to defend their families also, um, <laughs> sorry, as well as their young from enemies of all kinds and the hunt for their joint substance. Among the vertebrates, the king of the herd, or the pack, selects himself by his battle prowess upon the same general principles that induced Napoleon to place the iron crown upon his own brow with his own hand. All the regal houses of the world have been founded by fighting men and upheld by fighting men, just as in the brute creation. The chief recommendation to both animal and human chieftainship is fighting capacity. The common herd instinctively feels that a good fighter possesses all the requisite virtues of good leadership, and leadership is exactly what they want. By conquest alone can an animal king be deposed, and his vanquisher is always his successor. As long as his sight, hearing, strength, and courage endures, he is absolute lord, judge, procreator, and chief, but not one moment longer. The king's dead, long live the king, is a biological affirmative. This is the natural order. The unnatural order is the to appoint feeble but eloquent rhetoricians as chief magistrates or constitutional kinglings. This latter planus 
adopted only by human swarms in eras of senility and wholesale decadence. Politicians are everlastingly fighting each other, if we believe the sensational headlines of our editorial Daily Liar, but that kind of warfare is a sham intended to deceive. No real fight ever takes place between them. What they call fighting is gambling with eye, uh, eyes and nays, playing pitch and toss for the booty that other men win and the harvest that other men garner. Hark! Do not... Do yet hear them frothing at the mouth, loudly professing their divine enthusiasm for humanity. For what? In order that they squalid scoundrels that they are may sit on the seats of the mighty and steer the nation down to hell while putting money in their purses with taxes and blackmail. Nations have always risen to their highest pitch of fame and prosperity under the guidance of mighty men of valor, self-selected, and they've sank to the lowest depths of degradation and dishonor under the diabolical domination of elected rhetoricians. Their ravages are not so obtrusive in America as in Europe because territory here has been so vast, practically limitless. Okay, so there's some serious flaws in this logic. Some serious flaws. Defeating men to rape their women is not equal to women wanting stronger men. <laughs> not the same thing. And yes, the majority of, anecdotally, the majority of animals must fight and, and defend for their mating rights. Human animals do not, never have, because we have this abstract notion of love, as he has already mentioned, which goes above and beyond the idea of might. In some women, victory is an aphrodisiac. In some women, oration. <laughs> Maybe in all women, a little bit of oration, if you know what I mean, um, <laughs> down there, is attractive. I guess my point is that not even in the animal kingdom exclusively is this true. Sometimes it's whoever dances the best that gets the mating rights. Whoever grooms themselves with their feathers gets the mating rights. So this one-size-fits-all approach of might equals love equals right to mate is flawed completely. And it distills reproduction down to rape. And that is just not true. Inherent self-sacrifice would breed itself out of any population rapidly. If you do not live long enough to mate, you don't pass on your genes. <laughs> yeah, seriously. Interesting. All right. Two. Women instinctively admire soldiers, athletes, kings, nobles, and fighting men generally, above all other kinds of suitors, and rightly so. Nothing so lowers a lover in a virile maiden's estimation than for him to be whipped in a personal encounter with a rival. Among all classes of females, this sentiment persists. The best bid a man can make for the admiration of any woman, even the most pious, is a display of undaunted physical prowess. Young women have an instinctive detestation for the good young man that died kind of adorer, and they positively abhor the pale coward, even though they be a, he be a blood relation. Strength, energy of character, ferocity, and courage she admires in her possible husband, above all other qualities combined. Even to be carried off by force is not repugnant to her feelings, if the bold bad man is in other respects acceptable. She pines to be wooed and won, or, as it were, she likes to feel that she has been mastered, conquered, taken possession of, that the man who has stormed her heart is in all respects a man among men. The suggestive female idiosyncrasy is rhythmically set forth by an anonymous writer thus. Down a winding pathway in a garden old, tripped a beauteous maiden, but her heart was cold. Came a prince to woo her, said he loved her true. Maiden said he didn't, so he ceased to woo. Came a perfumed noble, dropping on one knee, said his love was deeper than the deepest sea. But the winsome maiden said his love was dead. And the perfumed noble accepted what she said. Came a dashing stranger, took her off by force, said he'd make her love him, and she did. 
of course. Conquer some personalities by obtaining possession of the best and handsomest females, raise up, as a rule, conquer some descendants. Hence the origin of great races. Second-class males are driven by necessity to mate with second-class females, and in strict sequence, third-class males select partners from feminine remainders, hence the stereotyped nature of servile castes. Superior males take racially superior women, and inferior males are permitted to duplicate themselves per media of inferior feminines. Each class reproduces its kind on the average, and if the ordained struggle for Earth's good things is not artificially interfered with, the leading classes are periodically called upon to maintain their preeminence at every turn by might or be swept away, enslaved, supplanted, expropriated, expropriated, expropriate by the braver and bolder animals. Aristocracies have always originated in war. Sham ones grow up like mushrooms in times of peace. No aristocracy ought to be allowed to dominate one moment longer than is unable to maintain itself by the edge of the sword. Again, subordinated classes should not permit themselves to be mastered by usurpers who cannot fight. It is the natural order for first-class men to dominate second-class men, and for second-class men to dominate third-class men. But the classes are self-selective by conflict. Someday, inferior breeds will be remorselessly exterminated as useless and noxious vermin. Behold, I judge the future by the evolutionisms of the past. Women congregate at athletic sports and gladiatorial contests, impelled by the same universal instinct that induces the lion's, uh, lioness to stand expectantly by, while two or more rival males are ripping each other to pieces in a rough and tumble for her possession. The lioness submits as a matter of choice to the embraces of the victor, and in the most fashionable society, the stalwart footballer or the dashing soldier has practically unlimited selective powers among the marriageable maidens of his own particular set. No nation, no empires has ever fallen, no race has ever been enslaved because it delighted in manly sports, in the hunting of boars and lions and men in deadly tournaments, in dueling, in prize-fighting, in gladiatorial combats, in scenes of cruelty and blood. No, not one! Nature is cruel, a million times more cruel than man has ever been. But dozens of civilizations have perished shamefully, ignominiously, because of the spreading canker of personal cowardice, gendered by <laughs> effeminacy, luxury, Usury, laboriousness, statecraft, superstition, culture, and peace. Want of daring, enfeeblement of physique, meanness of mind, fear of danger, and dread of death, sure signs of racial deterioration, have never originated with athletic tournaments, nor wars of conquest, nor gladiatorial games. When clericalism abolished the home gang, the pride of Norland silently waned away, when it abolished the Olympian Games, Greece rotted into decay, and when it banned gladiatorial contests, the Eternal City had its day. Bulldog virtues are bound to triumph in the long run as they can only be developed, if developed at all, by daily practice from youth up. Hence, the necess necessity of brutal football, brutal warfare, brutal personal encounters, brutal thoughts, and brutal combinations. The word brutal is written here because it is popularly misunderstood and used as a missile. The brutal races have always been victorious races. The greatest men have always been supremely brutal. Alexander, Sesostris, Caesar, Titus, Nero, Bonaparte, Cromwell, Grant, Bismarck, Cecil Rhodes. The word brutal in real life means the reverse of effeminate. A man is brutal who will not turn the other cheek. What is it the brutes do that in nature is wrong? Emerson perceived this pivotal anachronism clearly when he declared, Nature is erect, but man is fallen. Christlings are forever using the word brutal to terrorize each other. But who are they anyhow? Are they not the scum and dross and off-scorings and creeping things of the Aryan migrations, mere shrieking, blubbering, fulminating dwindlings of the very lowest intellectual development? 
Let Emerson again be put on the witness stand. He may be considered fairly impartial. Hear what he has to say. The waves, unashamed, indifference sweet, play glad with the breezes, old playfellows meet, the journeying atoms' primordial woes, firmly drawn, firmly driven by their animate poles. Sea, earth, air, silence, plant, quadruped, bird, by one music enchanted, one deity, nature stirred. Each the other adorned, accompanying still, Night vileth the morning, the vapor, the hill. Man crouches and blushes, absconds and conceals. He creepeth and sneaketh, he palters and steals. Infirm, melancholy, jealous, glancing around, an oaf, an accomplice, he poisons the ground. Athletic contests and combats of all kind, have a powerful influence in the moldings for the better, the personnel of uh, all participants therein. He who must meet worthy antagonists face to face and defeat them, or be himself defeated, ennobles his own mentality unconsciously, courage, coolness, intrepidity, purity of blood, the mental balance, are the athlete's first requisites. He must therefore be individualistic, self-reliant, and calmly resourceful, i.e., he must be brave. The brave man is ever generous, frank, outspoken, dauntless. His brow is open, his step fearless and firm, his bearing self-poised, leonine. He looks at you without a tremor, sums you up at a glance, and in business affairs, his word of honor is more binding than a Shylock's sealed bond. He may not be an erudite philosopher, a profound scholar, nor an eminent elocutionist, nor be troubled over much with the saving of his soul, but he is more than all that. He is a man. Hence, everywhere he is first favorite, especially with the feminine gender, whose sexual instincts are as true to nature as the needle is to the pole. What a tremendous difference is noticeable between the self-contained bearing of the bronzed soldier and the creeping suavity of the chalk-skinned shopkeeper, the vileness of the Hebrew moneylender, the sweet milk and honeyness of the venomous pastor, the base obsequiousness of the lean hireling, the boorishness of the ungainly peasant, and the fat, sleek cunning of the tax-eating polit political. Who can look upon them, bunched together, and honestly affirm that fighting does not tend to improve the stamina, beauty, vigor, and seed of the race? Healthy animalism is the foundation of all virtues whatsoever. Diseased bodies produce diseased minds, hence the noxious degeneracy of the average genius, hence also the shrieking madness of the blinded multitude. Average civilized men are more or less aberrations anyhow prenatal megalomaniacs. Sane men could never be induced to worship an idol made out of a medicant Jew, nor would they consciously erect the name of progress, state sausage mills for chewing up their own flesh and sucking their children's marrow bones, deranged minds while being very susceptible to suggestion, possess no initiative. It is the gibbering geniuses that are luring mankind down to eternal damnation. If these monstrous matoids had been smothered the day they were born, the earth and the air would have been purer, to that extent, had they not inoculated the human race with every malady, while proclaiming nostrums and infallible remedies for each incurable disease. From pulpit, platform, and library, they rant out their maniacal babblement and rabbles madder than March hares suck it all in, with open-mouthed wonderment. Hark! Do you hear consumptive fiendlings coughing out their literary, literary pestilence in the high places of the world? They would cure the sufferings of the submerged, would they? Physical uh, physician, heal thyself. Vain is the medicament that expels no contagion. Vain also is the rhetoric that cures no human woe. I love it when men tell women what women want. <laughs> I always found that really funny. 
I mean, anyone in general, right? Telling other people what they should want or what they do in fact want. But there is no more mansplaining than this previous, the beginning of this previous chapter when he's like, this is exactly what women want. <laughs> That's awesome. Yeah, um, <laughs> to your point, Zachary, I, I don't think he, he remembers much. I mean, he has a tunnel vision about what he wants to expound upon and what he wants to declare as, as truth, right? And so anything that does not fit that um, narrative, he brushes aside and just ignores completely. I mean, the, the reality, in my opinion... That's an interesting turn of phrase. The reality, in my opinion, um, is that all kinds are needed. You need philosophers. You need physicians. You need slaves. You need the weak. You need every and all kinds in order to have a world. Because if you were all just soldiers, you would be like Sparta and overthrown by your slaves. <laughs> or or you wouldn't, you know, you would have to do all of your own menial work as it were how many of you clean your own toilets how many of you clean other people's toilets does that make you weak are you cleaning the toilets of strong people you need all kinds absolutely He would be eaten alive by the feminist movement. Because it is very much schoolyard behavior. Like the, the previous two sections were all schoolyard behavior. A boy likes a girl, so he pulls her hair. A boy likes a girl, and so he beats up his friend so she can see how tough he is. Those are the, the base lizard brain actions of, of boys who don't understand women. Who don't understand reality. They just do what they think they would like, and so... Women must like it too. <laughs> yeah, absolutely. And Victor absolutely requires a loser. Until he becomes one, says might is right. <laughs> Three. Women take supreme delight in the roll of warlike drums, in the marching of the military in reading the poems and romances of battle, murder, and sudden death. Police gazettes are most supported by women because of the sensational homicidal reports. French women, even against their deep patriotic sentimentalisms, admired the fine physique and martial bearing of the German troops that poured through Paris in 71. The contrast between the tall clean-skinned German conquerors and the dwarfishness of the French National Guards was then most strikingly displayed. In France, all brutal sports are prohibited. Clericalism there has had full sway for centuries and now majority box socialism, also cynical squalid sensualisms, is all the rage. Wherever soldiers conquer in war, they also conquer in love. After the first paroxysm of revengeful patriotism is over. Women of vanquished races are usually very prone to wed with the men who have slaughtered their kindred in battle. Rudyard Kipling, in one of his popular ballads, touches upon this ethnic peculiarity with the, a masterly hand. By the old Molmine pagoda, looking eastward to the sea, there's a Burma girl, a Seton. And I know she thinks of me. For the wind is in the palm trees and the temple bells, they say. Come you back, O British shoulder, shul soldier, come you back to Mandalay. After the Battle of Senlac, Norman adventures were the prey of fair-haired Saxon maidens. To this hour, wherever line soldiers or men o' war's men go, amorous dusky daughters of conquered islands absolutely leap into their arms. New Zealand Maori women married British officers, soldiers and sailors in thousands, and when the regiments were sent home, many men remained rather than break up their families. At Gibraltar, Spanish senoritas literally stormed that rock-ribbed fortress to get at the widow's sons. 
the loves of red Indian maidens for pale-faced warriors, may someday find a homer to clothe them with immortality. Already, many have become world-famous, notably the epic of Pocahontas and that erratic filibuster John Smith. Since the marriage of Strongbow to Eva, the admixture of Celt and Sassanach blood has proceeded continuously from the same root cause. In garrison towns, it is a matter of perpetual witticism, the preference which females of all stratas display for soldier, soldier lovers. What modern Gaul requires to revigorate her ethnic stamina is wholesome and limitless conquest by some northern race. The conquerors, by seizing all the lands and movable property, would become immediately a ruling caste, attracting to themselves all the best feminines of France. This infusion of new blood would not strengthen the inherited physique of the invaders, but it would certainly invigorate the structural physique of the defeated tribe. No hand should be stretched forth to shield a self-poisoned breed of humans from utter subordination, for an undue preponderance of weakly organisms is not desirable. It is good that they should be swept away, and it is better that they should be swept away by war than by pestilence, as in China and India. Enslavement or annihilation is the just reward of wholesale physical debilitation. The Blackfeet's ruthless warfare against the Digger Indians was in strict accordance with the cosmic plan. The story of the past literally bristles with illustrations of ethnic displacement, carried out unconsciously perhaps, as herein set forth, but to resume the personal factor. Bryces, after her dearly beloved had been slain by Achilles, consoled herself with the self-delighted fact that the slayer would take her as spoil to his own bed. The Valkyries, Norse battle maidens, married only with their conquerors. After the storming of Troy, there was very little ceremony over the union of Ajax and Cassandra in the temple of Minerva. Although the Iliad epic, women are at once the property, the conqueror's prize, and the inspiration of all the Homeric warriors. It is notorious that when Rome and Greek matrons discovered no parental virility in their debauched consorts, they deliberately made advances to the blonde-bearded barbarians who had been imported from the frontiers, prisoners of war, to wrestle in the amphitheater. Many a dark-eyed patri patrician maiden of Italia throbbed with secret joy at the dual victory of her favorite fighter, and many another has wept her eyes out as the greedy, remorseless sand drank up the heart's blood of her dying gladiator. America women's passions for marrying foreign, uh, foreigners arises more or less from similar instincts. American-born men evince an alarming tendency towards impotency. Vita census returns. An immense number of them are old before they are young, and a very large proportion, more especially in the cities, are lean lantern-jawed profligrates or leering bald-headed wrecks. The nearest-born maids and matrons of Rome vied with each other for Caesar's smile when he, after killing one million men and enslaving two million, became imperator. Queens were proud to be his concubines, and one of his own natural sons, without knowing the fact, helped to assassinate him. The love scandals of David, Solomon, Aaron Burr, Sigurd the Volsung, Hercules, Jupiter, Apollo, Jehovah, Isis, Sir Galahad, Charles II, Henry VIII, Bonaparte, Alexander, Raleigh, and that dashing trimuvir Mark Antony had affected, for better or for worse, the whole world. Better the mistress of a king than the wife of a subject, was the saying once popular among European women in the ages when kings were really kings of men, when they were mail-clad sword-swingers, mighty men of valor. Modern kings are simulacra, simulacra, dilettante, scarecrows, robed in purple and paid liberal salaries to impersonate regalism for the delectation of the vulgar. Marionettes they are, fitted only to lay foundation stones, utter vicarious homilies, read off typewritten deceptions, or now and then dress up in swashbuckler accoutrements to review Messrs. Rothschilds, Ickelheimer, Bleichenroder, 
and company's Praetorian guards marching by in serried column with nodding plumes and bannered panoply of war. Modern kings are degenerates, even more so, if that be possible, than their laborious subjects. They have allowed all kingly initiative to be wrestled from them by the diabolical cunning of that plastic daemon, the Jew banker, that messes... Meth Mephistophelian manipulator of national debts and national credits. Kings have not been equal to the occasion, and resultantly, they and their brain-drugged subjects are bonded to the Israelite. The Jew has been supinely permitted to do what Alexander, Caesar, Nushwaran, and Napoleon failed to accomplish, crown himself emperor of the world, and collect his vast tributes from the ends of the earth." From the Mississippi Valley to the plains of the Hoang Ho, from Spitsbergen's icy uplands to New Zealand's iron shores, his satraps bear sway and his tax gatherers pillage, ravage, and rob. As long as the Aryan race bows down, even nominally at the sign of the cross or vacuously endeavors to keep the commandments, it is hopelessly entangled. It is delivered up, a burnt sacrificial offering to the Dolabra of the sons of Jacob. Jacob the supplanter. Maimonides, the philosopher of Hebraism, boldly suggests the view of orthodox Talmudists. The teachings of the Christian church, he proclaimed, tend to bring to perfection all mankind so that they serve Jehovah with one consent. For, since the whole world is thus full of the world, words of the Messiah, of the teachings of the Holy Writ and the commandments, these words have spread to the ends of the earth, even if any man deny the binding character of them now. Which, being interpreted, meaneth, tolerate, O children of Israel, the false religion of the crucified prophet. It will serve your ends most admirably. When the tribes of the West serve Jehovah with one consent, behold, they shall also serve you. Christ shall bring them to perfection, and ye shall put them into bonds." They have made you weep and suffer. Ye shall make them drip tears of blood, for the Lord your God hath said it. Nineteen centuries of evangelization with a Hebrew Bible as basis has resulted in what? The political, social, financial, and philosophical domination of the Hebrew. We study his falsified chronicles, his melancholy literature and his prophetic outpourings as if alone in such a nauseous heap of rubbish and stench the summon bonum was to be found. Not an acre changeth hands, not a battleship lifts an anchor, not a plowshare cleaves a soil, not a president vetoes a bill, not a diplomat signs a protocol, not an emperor waves a saber without direct inspiration from the hidden Hebrew potentate. Behold! The king is in his counting house, counting out his money, and such a king. Israel is absolute dictator, because he is absolute proprietor. The gold and the silver and the credits of the world belong to him, and as long as he hires politicians to utilize the military arm of government and the collection of his loans in the defense of his Iron Clan safety vaults, he is an irresponsible Jehovah Jira. But should force ever fail him, the lean dogs outside the wall will leap, snarling upon him, and spoil him from his spoil, that the fittest may survive. The Jews are ministers of gold, great bankers who see in the people and the state a mine to be worked. Our lifeblood is drawn from us by these harpies of finance and the game table, who mock us with illusions while they strip us of our all. The harm which the Jews commit does not come from individuals, but from the very constitution of these people. They are locusts, caterpillars, which ravage France, to whom commerce ought to be prohibited. There are two distinct yet parallel species of the parasitical Semite. The first, represented by Marx, Lasalle, Stepniak, and Jesus the Dreamer. The second, by Goshen, Rothschild, Bering, and Iscariot the banker. Between them, they practically extinguished civil liberty and personal independence wherever they have been sheltered. Viper-like, do they not bite the very mame, mame that gives them suck? What have they ever done to Gaul but eat her heart out? And Gaul was first to emancipate them. 
What are they now doing to Germany, Russia, England, America, Africa, Australia, poisoning the brain cells of the enslaved multitude while taking in pledge the plow and the harrow, the millstones and the mill? Over nations and empires and colonies and vassalage hangs the idle sign of the brazen crucifix that cures no ill. Over a world in bondage looms the dread shadow of the three golden balls. I have a real hard time reading that. Um, so when I was a young man, quick short story. When I was a young man, um, I was friends with uh, what I didn't know at the time were white supremacists. And I don't even think they really knew it, but they certainly were in their ideology. And so I started parroting not thinking, their thoughts and sayings during uh, class, during a literary class. Um, the instructor was so upset by the racist tropes that I was spreading, ignorantly, that she immediately changed the course and had us read um, Ellie Weasel's Night. which I still have right here. Uh, I don't know if I said his name, Weissel, I guess. Uh, this book completely changed my worldview. Absolutely. And if you have not read it, I highly recommend it. It is not big. It is not difficult. It is powerful. And I think it is important to understand. Uh, I do not... I do not support Zionism and I do not support Israel, but I certainly do not accept the idea that any one group is a vile snake, as he is suggesting here about Hebrews, as it were. Um, I do not support anti-Semitism, and so it is difficult for me, after my personal experience of being educated, to spit out this hatred and ignorance. Uh, thank you, Vasuri. So he recommends Night Father by Carl Friedman as well. Educate yourselves. Don't believe this racist bullshit. Four. As the stars and the suns and primordial atoms attract each other by odic force... So do handsome women and brave men. The nerve cells of splendid feminines and resolute warriors vibrate in rhythmic unison. Between them, there is a mutual Freemasonry that neither creed nor culture has ever been able to eradicate because it is part of the cosmic plan for evolving a higher and yet a higher type. Womankind mobilize in battalions of beauty at football matches, ball tournaments, aquatic carnivals, and sham battles, just as the feminines of Old Lang Syne gather at the archery sports, the Colosseum combats, the Olympian games, and the Neolithic war dances. In their worship of the warrior, Indian squaws, lionesses, and ballroom bells are in harmonious accord. Even in years of peace, peace may be considered a temporary truce, a partial suspension of the struggle for survival, civilians and female society are at a heavy discount when the gold-braided naval lieutenant or the captain in his whiskers is prowling around. At balls and receptions, the martial uniform carries all before it sexually, more especially if there be a man inside, <laughs> just as it does among the headhunters of Borneo, the cannibals of the Congo, the redskins of Oklahoma, or the gruesome savages of Chicago. University professors, priests disguised, and supplicants demagogues may rail in florid prose and honeyed lines of rhyme against military... Uh, militarism and the horrors of war, but they might, much more logically, rear up on their hind legs and bray fur furiously at the belts of Orion, or kick out in silly desperation at the glancing spears of the northern lights. Those literary luminaries, whose business is to dwarf public opinion, with spectacles on their noses, madness in their cere cerebe cerebrums, congestion in their livers, saplessness in their bones, fear in their hearts, and pens between their snaky fingers are never enthusiastically selected by virile women. 
when these poor, miserable manlings, geniuses, they name each other, do happen, by some lucky chance, to get a woman, they make her a life a torment, and scarcely ever leave any progeny behind them, for the doom of degeneracy is upon every nerve and filament of their bodies. Who ever heard of a lovelorn, lovelorn virgin risking her life or her reputation to mate herself with a sanctimonious creeping thing, or bespeckled savant? Did you ever look upon a great drama wherein the hero did not do a bit of fighting? Prince Charming is ever a performer of gallant actions. He conquers giants, outwits knaves, slaughters monsters, pulverizes wicked enchanters, and is an all-around preambulating terror to the wicked, that is to say, to the other fellow. A recent account of the Indian mutiny states that the first outbreak at Mirut was precipitated by a splendid native girl, hung with jasmine garlands who, womanlike, taunted her sepoy lover by hissing in his face when he came to visit her. We of the bazaar kiss no cowards. He left her in a rage and went out to recklessly precipitate the insurrection that ended by the blowing of the defeated from the mouths of the conqueror's cannon. As agents, provocateurs, women have never been surpassed by men. Cornelia trained up her two brilliant sons with a view to hurl them against and overturn the Roman oligarchs, a city harlot led by the sans culottes of the French Revolution. Queen Boadicea led her own army of painted Britons against the then all-conquering legions of Rome, a female epilep epileptoid since canonized, dressed herself in iron armor, mounted a war horse, and urged her demoralized countrymen to the forcible expulsion of an alien army. In American wars, the feminine has also played her part with Eclat, as she delights above all other women in tracing her own and her family's pedigree to revolutionary soldiers, pirates, filibusters, and through them to the mail-clad knights and heroes of long ago. No public library in this republic is without its complete set of stud books, and none are deeper students than, uh, thereof than women. Instinctively comprehending the determinate power of heredity, these students are vaguely endeavoring, in their own peculiar way, to solve the renowned Spencerian synthetic, having seen that the matter is indestructible, motion continuous, and force persistent, having seen that forces are everywhere undergoing transformation, that motion always follows the line of least resistance, is invariably rhythmic. It remains to discover the similarly invariable formula expressing the combined consequences of the actions thus separately formulated. Herod's wife and daughter and their secret alliance for getting John the Baptizer's head chopped off must not be overlooked, nor the calculated brutality with which Jael drove the tent peg into General Sisera's cranium when he slept. The folk fable of Delilah and Samson is also to the point. In many respects, women have proved themselves more cruel, avaricious, bloodthirsty, and revengeful than men. Women are also remarkably good liars. Deception is an essential and necessary part of their mental equipment. They are inherently deceitful. Man, however, reckoned upon that and discounted well in advance. Without deception of some sort, a woman would have no defense whatever against rival, lover, or husbands. We must not forget that women really hate each other intensely. It is as natural for women to prevaricate as it is for man to resent a blow on the face. It is their weapon. Hence they take up with false religions, priest crafts, superstitions much more readily than men. They like to play the hypocrite and pretend to be oh so holy when their secret thoughts are carnal, self-centered, and materialistic. When women think, they think falsely. When they follow their instinct, they do exactly what nature intended them to do, limited, of course, by the inevitable man, the brute that he is. Women are beautiful animals, delightful companions, affectionate mothers, sisters, and wives, kind-hearted friends, but they are born dissimulators. A woman is primarily a reproductive cell organism, a womb structurally 
embastioned by a protective, defensive, osseous network and surrounded with the antenna and blood vessels necessary for supplying nutriments to the growing ovum or embryo. Sexualism and maternity dominate the lives of all true women. To such an extent is this so that they have little time left or inclination to think. And therefore, they've never been fitted out ab initio with reasoning organs. Probably this is what Muhammad alluded to when he sen sentientiously affirmed that women have no soul. Even in man, the soul is probably a fiction, but in women, its absence is an absolute certainty. Women are made sexually attractive to equilibrate their lesser masculinity. It is man, the warrior's business to supply their wants and select the best of them for his own enjoyment and the propagation of his seed. They will not object except in a giggling, semi-sentimental sort of way because they comprehend their own incapacity for self-mastership and logical business methods. They are never touched with any sense of personal responsibility, are mere babies in worldly concerns, hysterical, well-supplied with tear glands, verbal mechanisms, <laughs> but lovable always. S slaves and women are notoriously incompetent of self-control, of holding their own business when not inspired and assisted by male friends. They are intended by nature to be loved and defended, but not to be equalized. Holy shit. <laughs> Holy shit. This guy got burned by some woman at some time. Um, I know far too many powerful women to agree with anything that that guy just wrote. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> they are well supplanted with tear ducts. <laughs> Holy shit. No wonder why women hate this volume. <laughs> God damn. That's wild. I don't think I'm going to finish this tonight. There's just no way. <clears throat> All right. I wonder if he ever got fucked. Like, how can you, how can you, if you really think that of the person that you want to have sex with, aren't you just basically having sex with an animal, a creature, a thing, not a person? And how would that be enjoyable? How would that be a conquest? Yeah, that's weird. All right. Five. When their passions are stirred, women have performed deeds of heroism and of terror that even a man with nerves of steel would hesitate at. They have fought on sea and land, the bravest of the brave. They have led armies and ruled empires and been criminals of the darkest dye. Masalina, Agrippina, Amestis, Charlotte Corday, Elizabeth of Russia, Jail, Fulva, Thoroughing de Mericourt, Jezebel, the Borgias, have all made themselves more or less infamous. Terrible is the rage of the billows. Terrorizing is the fear of poverty. But more terrorizing than all things is the hate of a woman. Euripides. Pseudo-scientists have lately investigated the female offender with anthropomorph... anthropometric accuracy, but their methods are puerile and unsatisfactory. Their very first principle is false. They begin by assuming that the criminal type is to be found in Gales, a most superficial and unscientific assumption. Only criminals who fail are found there, and by far the largest proportion of them do not fail. Naturally enough, successful criminals have not been investigated by Messrs. Ferrari, Lombroso, Havelock, Ellis, et al. That being so, their sagest conclusions are vitiated, Indeed, it is an accepted truism among criminals and police that only the fools are caught. Many of our most eminent men in law, medicine, science, religion, and statesmanship are criminals. Criminals of the most atrocious description. The difference between the man who rules in the castle and the other man who is chained in the castle dungeon is the difference between success and failure. 
There is a strong affinity between the criminal and the conqueror. If Washington, for example, had failed, he would most probably have been hunted down and hung as an outlaw and traitor. However, he won by force and consequently became a mighty potentate. King David was a sheep stealer and a blackmailer until he triumphed. Then he became a man after God's own heart. William the Norman was also a criminal and 50% of his invading army were exiled outlaws. But by conquest, he became king of England, and his followers blossomed into nobles. Hence the Spenserian dictum, the sole truth that transcends experience by underlying it, is the persistence of force. This being the basis of experience must be the basis of any scientific organization of experience. To this, the ultimate analysis brings us down, and on this rational synthesis must be built up. First Principles, page 62. Criminals and statesmen are visible embodiments of the persistence of force. Now, that being so, scientists should define unmistakably what they mean by crime before commencing to elaborately tabulate the criminal type. But whether a criminal is successful or not, he seems to have a peculiar fascination for women. He who risks his life to advance his fortunes may reckon beforehand upon unlimited feminine approval. If he succeeds and becomes a millionaire, a chancellor, a president, or a king, he has only to hold up his hand to be literally rushed by the handsomest feminines in the land. And even if he fails bravely, women will gather in shoals to visit him in gale, besieging him with banquets and proposals of marriage, even at the gallows. In Michigan, a law has lately been enacted to prohibit female adorers from sending flowers to condemned murderers, burglars, and bank wreckers. Lombroso says somewhere that good and passionate women have a fatal propensity to love bad men, but with characteristic want of the logical faculty, he abstains enthusiastically from defining good and bad. Bella Starr, the border bandit who died in a fight with state troops, was the daughter of a guerrilla chief. She selected her numerous husbands from the bravest daredevils in her band, and on the slightest sign of cowardice, they were discarded. I do love a fellow who shows grit, was a common expression of hers. A printed catalogue of the sanguinary duels that have been fought through jealousy would not be less than fifty miles thick. The mythical Cain and Abel are supposed to have quarreled over some antediluvian young woman's charm, and she must have married Cain. If the duels between the animals, plants, birds, fishes, germs, and infusor infusorians for possession of the female were also added thereto, this planet would not contain the first chapter of the first volume. Women like to be able to say that two men have fought over them. All female animals display a similar, similar peculiarity. Bush rangers, Free booters, rebels, pirates have never lacked for love romances. Plays and novels by the thousands have been written upon their escapades and are always perennially popular, from the Arabian Nights down to Marie Corelli and Oidan, Oida. It is one long rhythmic lilt of love and women and war. Women authors are specially prone to glorify in their heroes beauty of form, daring, hardihood, and resolution. Jesse James and his reckless band of outlaws also had their famous love adventures. The mother of the James boys had her arm torn off by the explosions of a detective's bomb thrown through her bedroom window in the darkness of the night. The memory of Brennan on the moor and his dashing Inamorata, who handed him a blunderbuss from underneath her cloak, is still as green as the hillside of Innisfail. Like Ma Mohammed, Tell, William Wallace, Caesar, and Napoleon, this famous outlaw's popularity rested on a suggestive economic fact. He never robbed a poor man upon the king's highway, but what he taken from the rich he gave unto the poor, so bold and undaunted was Brennan on the moor. Though not cast in the American mold, Mr. Brennan was somewhat of a practical statement, decidedly. According to Inspector Shack's very clever written pamphlet, each of the Chicago bomb throwers had his own romance. An heiress supplied money for the defense of one whom she proposed to marry, but the most daring and logical of them all, when defeated, fell upon his sword like unto Brutus and Cato and Saul. That is to say, he blew his head off with explosives brought to him by his lady love. It is also noteworthy that he was the son of a crown prince, 
hereditary, therefore, may have had as much to do with the magnitude of his concept in Se Magna Runt. Another of these slave-betrayed, mob-abandoned enthusiasts was the brother of an American general and seems to have led a wandering, adventurous life, finally falling head over heels in love with a southern squadron, uh, quadrant, who's still zealously fans the embers of her dead husband's agitation, limited, of course, by police censorship. Whenever she rises to speak in the city, she is surrounded by stenographic moochards and by armed officers of the law in picturesque uniforms. By direct command of the people, two of those men were choked to death and two others had their necks neatly broken amid reverberating shouts of worldwide approbation. Their power was not equal to their logic, and consequently they were snuffed out in strict accordance with the law of the survival of the fittest. They who make half-revolutions dig their own graves, is an old Cromwell proverb that they had evidently failed to properly consider. Thus the vibrations of matter and motion are to be seen in all social phenomena, and regal authority is upheld by the combined strength of arm and brain that gave it birth. Man, like every other animal, must remain subject to the severe struggle. Darwin. Love in sexual relationship, power in social adjustments, polarity in magnetism in physics, gravitation in astronomy, and might in ethics are exact synonyms. Correlation, uh, correlated phrases of one primary assertive. The persistence of force. Se nu san. So nasi. The Sultan of Turkey has been melodramatically described by W. E. Gladstone, that grand old spider, as the assassin of the century, and yet the women of the East, even those of Armenia, would claw each other's eyes out for half a chance to enter his harem. Dr. Jameson, the South African freebooter and his chief, Cecil Rhodes, though unmercifully abused and denounced as wicked criminals, are continuously being deluged with written proposals of marriage from heiresses on both sides of the Atlantic. These two men, by force and diplomacy, stole two million acres of the finest agricultural and pastoral land in Africa, together with the gold mines, silver mines, copper mines, diamond mines, also vast herds of sheep and cattle. They carried fire and swords into the strongholds of their enemies, shot gods with rifle bullets, cut the throats of priestly sorcerers in scores, shed the blood of adversaries like water, and reduced the defeated Kafirs to a respectful condition of constitutional freedom. There is no cant in hypocrisy about Cecil Rhodes. None. He is a man made whole, blunt as Napoleon or Bismarck. He is, in his own sphere of the Caesar, Cromwell, Darwinian stock. Believing implicitly in the survival of the fittest, he is the despair of the priestling and the terror of the politician. He laughs at their parchment laws and shrieking editor ed editorials. He rides roughshod over their golden rules. He scorns their sermons on the mount. He spits upon their tabulated commandments. He takes what he wants, and if he has the power, uh, if he has the power, not otherwise. He does not beg. He does not pray. He does not steal. No. He goes direct for what he wants and annexes it if he can. Nor does he weep crocodile tears over the enslavement of races that nature manifestly stamped with inferiority. In days long gone by, such men were the norms of Anglo-Saxondom. Now, alas, alas, they are astounding exceptions. If this republic had produced one Cecil Rhodes Forty years ago, the civil war, provoked by idiotic emotionalism, would never have been fought. Civil wars are necessary when a country is overstocked, but these states were not overpopulated in 1862. Instead of sounding the jubilee for plantation niggers, he would have sounded it for his own race by sending Grants and Shermans not to plunder and devastate the Shenandoah Valley and the home of Washington, but to seize, conquer, and recolonize. South and Central America, from El Paso to Cape Horn. And that's it for today. Sweet hell. My goodness. <clears throat> I'm out of practice. <laughs> Taking too long. All right. Uh, thank you guys so much for tuning in. Especially to this portion where it's just getting weirder and weirder, right? Um, 
he starts off talking about women and then jumps over to ethnicity and then to war and then back to women. And it's just sort of like all over the place. I mean, we don't have a lot left. So the next time I do this, it's going to be the end. But I do want to finish reading um, the Federalist Papers before I come back and finish this. Uh, so, again, thank you so much for your time and attention. I'm going to go eat some pizza. I hope you guys are going to have a fantastic evening. And if you want to support this channel and support what uh, I'm doing here and the different series that I'm pr producing here, um, subscribe to the YouTube channel. Sign up to the email list. And if you're getting this via podcast, which is available, search Reverend Campbell wherever you get podcasts. Give me a rating or a review. Thank you guys so much once again. And until next time, hail Satan. Oh yeah, and don't be a racist, sexist douche. <laughs>